You're listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, where you get valuable information you just can't find anywhere else. To thrive in today's trying times, you need the Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and get your free newsletter and gift. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever. And welcome. You are watching and listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Well, today is April 12th, 2021. And uh, lots to talk about here. We've got a digital yuan, but it comes freshness dated, just like all those products in the supermarket that will go bad on exactly the day uh, the day that they're uh, dated for. So too with the digital yuan. What are your thoughts about the digital you want? Send us an email to my personal email address, kl at kerrylutz.com. Right now, John Rabino of dollarcollapse.com is with us. Happy Monday, John. So digital you want, what do you think? Hey, Kerry. Oh, this is a big deal because uh, for, for several years now, there's been this thing called the war on cash that everybody's been talking about, but there really wasn't much to it other than really low interest rates, which... Um, actually kind of make you want to hold cash instead of leave it in the bank. But um, one of the things that was always going to happen, at least, uh, you know, according to the theoreticians in the monetary world who were trying to figure out how to eradicate cash, is they had to make cash unattractive to hold. Otherwise, right, when interest rates go negative, then everybody holds cash, and that short stick circuits their plan to impose negative interest rates on the whole world. So one of the things they've been talking about doing is um, putting like a sticker on physical cash that is like, you know, the sticker on your license plate on your car where it expires after a certain day and you have to get a new sticker. Uh, well, they were gonna do that with cash where the cash either just stops being valuable after a certain day or loses value progressively over time uh, as a way of forcing you to spend it instead of hoard it. And, you know, that sounds just, crazy to normal people ears, right? Because because uh, it's the sign of a really desperate government doing things that, uh, that don't make any sense, except to the extent that it helps them screw regular people over. Um, and But they never did it. You know, none of, none of this stuff ever actually came true until now, um, possibly with the digital yuan. China is now bringing out a digital currency that, you know, frankly, really isn't all that different from its existing currency, because most of what you do with a modern currency is digital anyhow. So it's not that big of a deal, except that it's going to completely replace um, the physical yuan. Um, and they might put an expiration date on it. You know, once it becomes just a digital thing, they can they can give it attributes. And one of the attributes might be that it has a shelf life, you know, and, and after a certain point, it stops being valuable. And we have to or Chinese people have to um, buy stuff with it. And in that way, they stimulate the economy um, via what Keynesians like to call aggregate demand. In other words, how much stuff are we buying, which is their holy grail. You know, as long as we're buying a bunch of stuff, their world is, is happy and the economy is healthy. Uh, and they can discourage savings because in the Keynesian world and in the authoritarian world of, of somebody like the, uh, you know, the dictators running China, um, saving is bad because it empowers individuals. In other words, if, you know, if you're flat broke, you don't have a penny to your name, you're at the mercy of the powers that be. But if you have a bunch of money in the bank or under the mattress and or, or you know, in, in real things like gold and silver or farmland or whatever, the stuff we keep telling people to buy, um, you're a free individual who can make choices for himself. So the idea behind a, a digital currency that has a shelf life is that um, it, it encourages you to spend rather than save. And in that way, make yourself more and more vulnerable to coercion on the part of the, um, the, the whatever dictator happens to be in charge of whatever company, country you happen to be in. Uh, so this is a big deal on a lot of levels. You know, digital currencies uh, that eliminate cash, eliminate financial privacy. Digital currencies that have a shelf life eliminate savings. So they're basically trying to get rid of the last vestiges of free individualism in the world. And so, yeah, you know, this is, this is serious. And um, 
you know, it looks like it's going to get tried. So the question is, how do we respond to that? And I, you know, I would say, you know, here comes the gold bug pitch. <laughs> I would say you respond to that by owning other kinds of money that governments can't just make more of, you know, force them to make gold and silver illegal. And let's see what happens. And then the question becomes, where is Bitcoin in all of this? Is Bitcoin an alternative version of cash that people can jump into and thereby have financial privacy and financial autonomy and short circuit the whole um, a digital currency with a shelf life kind of thing? Or is it, um, is it an, a target you know, that, um, that they're gonna have to wipe out the way they're wiping out physical dollar cash to succeed in this game, you know, so we'll see. I suspect that, uh, you know, we've talked about in the past how Bitcoin is going to become a target now that it is sufficiently high profile, that it's a threat to the big fiat currencies. So the, the empire is going to strike back. And this whole um, digital currency with the shelf life thing is just another reason for the empire to want to strike back against crypto. So, you know, we have some absolutely chaotic and absolutely fascinating times coming here. And we really need to think about what side we're on in all this, because it's not just a question of what's more convenient financially in the short run. It's what kind of world do you want? You know, do you want one where you literally don't get to save money, which means you live paycheck to paycheck, which means you're at the total mercy of the corporation that employs you or the government that controls the corporation or whatever. So, you know, it's big brother time starting now. And we have to decide what we want to do about that. You know, you're going to need, you know what you're going to need, John? You're going to need a, a digital mattress <laughs> to hold your digital uh, currency. And then the question is, you got this digital yuan, what can they stop you from exchanging it for, uh, for Bitcoin or other cryptos? My gut feel is, yes, they can. Probably is not going to be uh, convertible into other cryptos other than uh, perhaps other countries. Uh, I don't know. It's it sounds like it's a digital currency only in name, but it's a currency that, that comes with strings and the strings are that you got to spend it a certain time and that you it's not going to be translatable into other currencies at all. In which case it's a captive market. No wonder they wanted to stop Facebook from uh, its own digital currency and I wonder if Facebook and the other tech giants have really given up the idea altogether, or it's just on the back burner. Well, yeah, remember when Facebook um, brought out a currency that was going to challenge the dollar and then it disappeared without a trace? Well, basically what happened was the, uh, the NSA or the CIA or somebody went to those guys and said, you know, you don't need to do this. You can make insane amounts of money in the world we're, we're building here. But if you challenge the dollar, we'll probably have to kill you. You get that, right? And we'll kill your family, you know, and that, which they is you know, totally what the FBI would say to somebody in that situation. So, oh, yeah. So, so the, the digital currency that Bitcoin or that uh, Facebook brought out just went away, you know. And so now it's Bitcoin's turn. And yeah, it, they can. I mean, they can make it illegal very easily. That's a quick thing with historical precedent. They did that with gold already. Um, then the question becomes, see, there, some CA or SEC official came out the other day and said, well, you know, you can't really make Bitcoin illegal without um, shutting down the whole global internet, can you? You know, and so I, that, that might have been somebody accidentally telling the truth. We'll see. Um, but or maybe that was a trial balloon to see how the uh, Bitcoin community would respond to that. I don't know. You know, the, all of this stuff is coming, but we just don't know the details of it. But we know that for certain things to happen that the uh, the monetary authorities want to happen, other things do have to happen. So they, they've got to try to make those other things happen. And we'll see, you know, and digital currency is one. Um, the war on cash is another, the, uh, the war on cryptocurrencies is coming, um, possibly restrictions on gold, who knows, you know, so <laughs> silver keeps looking better and better because it's an industrial commodity that, you, you know, you can't really regulate it because then the solar panel guys will go out of business and electric cars won't, you know, so there's a lot of, of, um, uh, of mixed, um, points of view out there with industrial commodities 
like silver, which there aren't with just monetary metals. So it's possible <laughs> that silver is the thing you need to own and maybe copper is the other thing, you know, stuff that has to be used industrially, but still has maybe a tiny bit of monetary history and, and can still be traded and held physically. So I don't know, there's a, a new era in prepping that's coming and we have to see what happens um, you know, coming down from the top before we know how we shift our prepping strategies. But we need to be on top of this because I, I think the old version of prepping where you have a you know bunch of dollar cash, a bunch of Krugerrands and maybe some silver coins, uh, that, that might have to change a bit. So we'll just have to see how it goes, but we need to be on top of this as it plays out. Oh yeah, for sure. Hey, so real estate prices are picking up in New York City. And at the same time, New York City and state are raising, or at least New York State's raising uh, taxes on the super wealthy, inviting yet more of them to move down to my state here, Florida, or to yours, Washington State, where there's no income tax. I mean, 15% they're looking at between the combined New York City and state income taxes. And haven't they been paying attention? Uh, I guess they're not counting the change of address uh, the change of address forms that are being filed with the post office in ever greater numbers there to the point where I can see New York uh, doing like what New Jersey did and having an exit tax. If you sell your home and you're not buying a new one in New Jersey, they hit you for an exit tax. <laughs> Got to be unconstitutional, <laughs> but they've been doing it. Well, you know, I hear there's a lot of surplus automatic machine guns still in warehouses in, in East Germany. So maybe they could get a good deal on something like that and just put them at all the borders. So any anytime somebody tries to drive, you know, the bridge and tunnel people try to get into New York, New Jersey shoots them and vice versa. But um, I, I'll tell you what New York and New Jersey are thinking with uh, feeling like they can raise taxes now. They're assuming that the federal government is going to raise the cap on salt tax write-offs, which is in effect a big tax cut for the high tax states. Because, um, you know, what the Republicans did, which they thought was such a fun thing to do, was they imposed a cap on how much of your state and local taxes you can write off on your federal taxes, right? Which suddenly made California and New Jersey and uh, and New York and who else has high taxes? Does uh, who, where where are all the hedge fund guys? not Delaware, but Connecticut, Connecticut. It made them harder places to live because your tax bill went way up. Well, those guys are now counting on Biden to do away with the salt cap, ta salt tax cap, and maybe even, you know, increase some kind of a government subsidy for people who have to pay high st state and local taxes um, as a way of making it more tolerable to live in New York and places like that. So I think that's part of the uh, the reason New York real estate is starting to go back up because uh, those people are looking ahead and thinking, okay, you know, the tax burden won't be nearly as bad as uh, as we thought it was going to be because Biden's going to help us out. So why not buy that, uh, that depreciated condo on Fifth Avenue or whatever? Hey, you know, Yellen, I think it was, came up with this concept of a uh, minimum uh, corporate tax by all the countries in the EU and around the world so that you won't be able to move around to minimize your tax burden. Maybe she was really referring to a minimum state income tax that they want to force every state, including states that don't have income taxes now to impose. So you'll have no reason to move from New York to Florida other than the weather and other than the fact it's uh, kind of becoming a libertarian state for our very eyes. Okay, you're joking about that, but you're doing it the way we used to joke about um, uh, currencies that had uh, um, time value, you know, where where the value of it ran out over time. And that's that looks like that might happen. So it's completely possible that the federal government imposes a, a uniform minimum state and local tax income tax, for instance, or property taxes or whatever um, across the country, because that's fair, right? Because it's unfair that some people have to pay more state taxes than other people. And, uh, and you know, Texas and Florida are attracting all these, these rich people, and it's just making their budgets that much more healthy. So they'll never have to impose taxes on, you know, so that, that's a, a very easy 
political story to tell from the left. So don't be surprised if the, uh, well, I think it would take a, um, a younger Bernie Sanders to come along because probably Biden wouldn't do that just because he's, um, um, he's not very adventurous. Um, and it might make corporations mad. And since that, that's who pays his bills, blah, 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 you know, um, it, it would be harder for him to do it. But that is in the pipeline, stuff like that. The uniformity of economic, financial and tax policy across the United States is definitely something that's that's coming at some point, which means, again, you know, we got to try to figure out how to how to set up our finances now in anticipation of this stuff. And I think the solution to that is geographic diversification. You need money overseas, right? You know, you've got to put your money somewhere. And even that's just a stopgap. But um, you know who George Gammon is probably, right? Oh, yeah, sure. He's actually coming to town shortly. And I'm going to be seeing him later this week. OK, because talk to him about Puerto Rico. You know, he just did a whole thing on how, you know, because he I guess he was down there. He spent a lot of time in Puerto Rico to get the four uh, percent yeah, yeah. tax on out of Commonwealth income. I've been uh, seriously considering a move there myself, but it, the tax rates kind of held for ransom, the price of which is you have to live in Puerto Rico for 183 days a year, I was thinking, well, so I stay there for six days, six six months and a day. And then I said, you know, I could just go back, stay in Florida a couple of weeks and then go back to Puerto Rico for two and a half weeks and do that like 10 times a year or 20 times a year. And then, uh, then I'm kind of covered. Don't just survive, thrive. The Financial Survival Network. Today's show is brought to you by Mistango River Resources. Their flagship projects are located in Kirkland Lake, an established gold camp that has historically produced over 70 million ounces of gold. The Kirkland West Project is a high-grade gold project beside Kirkland Lake Gold's world-class Mikasa Gold Mine, one of the highest-grade mines in the world. The Umeja Project is an advanced-stage project with 600,000-plus ounces of gold along the Cadillac Break, 25 kilometers kilometers east of Mikasa. Their projects have the potential to transform into another world-class mining camp in the Kirkland Lake District. Make sure you go over to mistango.com, that's M-I-S-T-A-N-G-O.com, take a look and sign up for notifications. Stock is traded on the Canadian Stock Exchange, ticker symbol M-I-S. For more information and to sign up for notifications, go to mistango.com. This is the Financial Survival Network, the information you need to thrive now more than ever. Well, here, here's what George Gammon said in a video just lately. He said it's, it's, you know, he loved it there for the longest time, but it's become a COVID police state where anybody sees you without a mask or anything, even if you're in your car with the windows up, they, they go ballistic. So he hates it now. He says, do not go to Puerto Rico, except... <laughs> <laughs> there's there's one super high end hotel complex. I think it's the Hilton, something Hilton, where they totally take care of you once you're in once you're in that compound. You're a free man again, which now you'd probably go there anyhow, Carrie. That would probably be the place you choose, so you're probably okay. But he said, and the other end of the spectrum is you can get there are parts of Puerto Rico where you can get a shack on the beach. And you just surf all day and nobody bothers you there. So one or the other, e either of those things work, but nothing in between in Puerto Rico is good anymore. So <laughs> he'll tell you all about it when you see him. All right, I'm going to ask him because uh, that's like the one tax haven for Americans. It's the best one in the world. And once you're in Puerto Rico, then, you know, you can leave the country and go wherever you want as long as you're in Puerto Rico, it, you know, as long as you declared your, your residence there, uh, I think you're okay. But yeah, you know, that's a, that's a bridge too far. So, hey, we're looking at the uh, Elon Musk's Las Vegas boring tunnel system opening uh, to less than stellar reviews. It's going to go 35 miles an hour, have Model S's and Model X's and have a driver. But uh, hey, this is the beginning stages. It's a little too early to proclaim it a failure. And these things need to ramp up. It's a new system. You have to be safe. And then uh, supposedly they're bringing in the higher capacity vehicles in the, in the future. Uh, and it'll probably go faster too. I mean, it's only a mile long tunnel, 4,400 square feet, uh, 4,400 feet in each direction. So 
it's going to be interesting to see if this thing can uh, become a success or not. Well, I, I think it's the beginning of a major transition in human history, really, because if we can build tunnels cheaply, then we can all move underground. And, you know, climate controlled under there, you don't have to have air conditioning or heat or anything like that. You use um, um, full spectrum lighting, so it's like you get sunshine. And then the whole surface of the world can be one big national park. So we come up and we're in Yellowstone or uh, Glacier National Park or Denali or something like that. Um, and so we basically give the world back to nature and live underground. That's my proposal. So hopefully yeah. Elon Musk picks up on it. And you okay. know, it's easier than moving to Mars. Yeah, I don't know. It, uh, it might be easier to move to Mars in the final analysis, but uh, we're going to have to see. It's a little too early in the day to proclaim it a failure. These things take time. The one thing he did, though, was actually build these tunnels uh, ahead of schedule and under budget. And uh, some of their payment is uh, contingent upon them getting enough people, 4,400 people per hour moved by the system. Maybe they'll do it. Who knows? And the uh, trial of uh, Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis cop accused of murdering uh, George Floyd, looks like it's imploding before our very eyes. Uh, you're watching the prosecution's witnesses uh, look more like their defense witnesses. And then the prosecution is in the position where they have to try to impeach their own witnesses and and denigrate their testimony to not uh, convince the jury there's reasonable doubt. This one uh, is worthy of watching because, uh, you know, it's like defund the police uh, has turned into refund the police, murder rates up all over the country, John, and uh, maybe getting rid of the police and replacing them with social workers isn't, uh, isn't optimal. Yeah, well, you know, Carrie, I, I don't wanna make a joke out of this because somebody died and it's not funny. I can't help myself here. So let's say somebody dies because the, the police abuse them and they have an overdose of fentanyl and they have COVID-19, what, what's the official report supposed to say then? I think they're gonna choose COVID because they're desperate for COVID deaths. Yeah. So even in that circumstance, they're gonna say, oh, COVID killed him. He had it when he died, therefore, you know? Yeah, you never know, yeah. these guys. Hey, finally, we got a couple other things. What happened to the Reddit traders? What happened to hashtag short silver squeeze? And uh, GameStop is, uh, they're now looking for a new manager. I read the cost, uh, the cost electronics company, a family still owns, the cost family still owns 75% of the shares. They sold $45 million worth of their stock during the whole uh, Reddit run up. And I'm glad that somebody actually did well on this deal, John. Well, so you, you wanna talk about winning the lottery. Picture a big shareholder in GameStop three years ago, let's say. Actually, I was a, a GameStop shareholder. I bought it at 10, sold it at 13, and I was happy to get out of it back in the day, you know? But, but anyhow, picture somebody who has a big part of their life savings in GameStop. It's, it's well on its way to bankruptcy because, you know, it's a physical store that sells digital media. How, what, what kind of a future can it have? Everybody assumes it's bankrupt, its stock is tanking, and then this thing happens. Then completely out of the blue, the, the Reddit traders, of all the stocks they could pick, you know? There's a, there's a whole universe of stocks they could have jumped into that had big shorts against them and and that um, you know didn't necessarily look like they they were going to do very well in the future stocks like that are a dime a dozen but somehow they picked game stock and the guys who had that stock at three or four or ten dollars a share suddenly find themselves owning a bunch of stock that's worth two hundred dollars a share just out of nowhere for no reason at all uh, <laughs> you know, lightning can strike out there. So kind of makes you want, want to go out and buy a bunch of crappy companies just at random to see if uh, see if you can be the next GameStop millionaire. Wait, there's a fund manager who's doing that right now as we speak, John. <laughs> I am. <laughs> see her and then we got to well, get... Yeah. yeah, I mean, that is probably an investment thesis out there. Like, what is the crappiest company you can find that has a big short position against it? And then you go on the Reddit boards and say, hey... I heard about the next GameStop, you know, so they're, they're probably out there, people doing that right now. Yeah, for sure. Hey, so March deficit uh, was the biggest in history, three and a half times higher expenditures than what was brought in by taxes. That doesn't sound too sustainable, does it? Oh, but 
you know what, we're going to have a big GDP number in this quarter, though, Carrie. It's going to be a really impressive number, um, which which means the economy is growing. Everything's fine again. Uh, I don't know why you're being so negative. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It just, just comes with my nature. <laughs> uh, hey, so finally, you pointed out subprime auto loans. They're crashing while auto sales are spiking. Now, that is that seems to be two contradictory trends occurring at the same time. Yeah, it doesn't seem like those two things should happen at the same time, because so for the last few years, it, it's been the conventional wisdom that subprime auto lending was driving the car sales market. And that it was, you know, people, everybody else had cars, but the people with crappy credit all of a sudden could get loans because the uh, the banks, the car dealers were so desperate. So they were buying, well, they were taking out car mortgages, you know, seven or eight years for a brand new car that was going to depreciate by 40% the minute they drove it off the lot. Really bad deal for them, but it was generating a lot of car sales. Well, now those guys are having trouble paying their car mortgages and delinquencies are spiking, yet so are car sales. So the question is, well, well, who's left to buy these cars? And and it looks like part of it is that um, a, a lot of people actually did really well in the pandemic. They were enriched by the stay at home e-commerce boom and by rising stocks and bonds. So those are the people who are out there buying brand new cars and electric cars have finally hit the mainstream. So now it's not just Tesla. You, of course, you can buy a Tesla if you want to, but you can also buy a Ford Mustang that everybody likes or an Audi or a Lexus or a Mercedes. And, and so car sales, in part because of the novelty of EVs and in part because um, so many people have just come into a bunch of new money and they're, you know, they're playing with house money, so why not buy a new car? Um, that car sales are booming. You, you know, you can't keep an F-150 pickup truck on the lot, apparently now unless it's pink you know yeah. if, if it's a normal pickup truck it, it sells the day you get it in if you're a dealer uh so at a premium uh, yet another sign that we're in a bubble because stuff like that should never happen first of all and it definitely shouldn't happen um well are we still in the boom that happened that, that began in 2009 or did the the you know little flash crash um in 2020 stop the cycle, and now we're in a new expansion. I don't know how they calculate that, but I think we're still in the same expansion uh, that began after the Great Recession. So let's say we're 12 years in now to, to a dramatic expansion. Stuff like car sales booming don't happen 12 years in, you know, and unless you're in a blow off top. Yeah. It's going to be followed by an epic bust. So, um, so okay, you know, that, that seems reasonable that this could be a sign of a bust in, in pending. All right. Well, that is it for today. Make sure you go over to John's site, dollarcollapse.com and ours, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for a free newsletter. Send me emails for John, kl at kerrylutz.com. John, we'll talk to you next Monday. All right. See you, Kerry. Thanks for listening to Carrie Lutz's Financial Survival Network, your solution to today's trying times. For the latest, go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Financial Survival Network, now more than ever.